It's a pleasure to be back with our partners at ATR in Kyiv, Ukraine. We have a very special guest today, and let me hopefully I don't destroy his name when I say it. The Father Priest Vitaly Mensek. He is the rector of the Church of St. Basil the Great. Father, welcome to the program. Greetings to you. Hello. Father, tell us a little bit about mm. uh, you, what you do. It's very unique. You have a priest and a soldier. That's very unique here in the United States, at least in other parts of the world, too. I have been a priest for 26 years now. At the beginning of the war of Russia against Ukraine back in 2014, we began first to go into volunteering activity to help our armed forces. And we had a challenge back then. Not only military personnel would have to be helped materially, like we had to shoot, to dress them, and we had to help the government and the armed forces, but they also sorely needed spiritual food. We had to work with the soldiers who were defending our motherland. At the beginning of the war, this was extremely difficult to do because our nation, our people, are the ones that were totally unprepared for this war. And average citizens, rank and vile, vile citizens, the ones that have never taken arms into their hands, that have never killed people, the people who, who had never done any military assignments, so these people would have to go to the battlefield. And this was a real problem to explain to the soldiers that they were not killers or murderers. Mm -hmm. Instead, they were defenders of each and every one of us, of their parents, their children, and every citizen of Ukraine who were staying back in the rear. This was really challenging for us to do because it's not characteristic, it's not typical for people to kill. However, we had to go and kill. We were forced to do so because we had to protect our land. So this was a pivotal moment. Soldiers in Ukraine, you know, uh, the majority of people are believers, especially Orthodox believers. And they were extremely fearful of uh, violating the commandment, thou shall not kill. So we had to interpret and explain it to them that these were not just the people, but the enemies of God um, that we were confronted with who had come to kill us, destroy us. So we had to stand up and fight and struggle for our land, defend our country, defend each and every one of us. The years 2014 and 15, at first, there were a lot of heated battles, and then there was a positional warfare. And in the positional warfare, it's easier to do your service as a serviceman, as a clergyman, because you have more opportunities to see soldiers face to face. Uh, during this armistice period, there were no contact battles. So the war was pretty much over in 2015, and this was the positional warfare, and we had a greater access to soldiers that we could talk to, uh, we could uh, um, make sure that they had communion, they went to confession, and they liked it very much, and they uh, perceived us to be their angels' guardians. There were several instances when they saw, when we were present, uh, they saw some invisible protection, at least this was their perception, something un uncommon, unusual for them. Substance was helping and protecting them. Because uh, the greater part of the believers, uh, they came from the west of Ukraine and central Ukrainian residents. They were far from church services and they did not perceive uh, priests as such. Mm -hmm. So a great deal of work had to be done to help our soldiers. Another important mo point to mention. Okay. There was a lot of support rendered to our soldiers. Uh, there were a lot of people, especially appointed people, to bring up 
the consciousness of the soldiers. And we had to work with the officers respectively for them to understand how they would have to deal with the soldiers, for them to understand our cooperation with them. Okay. At the beginning of the full-scale invasion, this was all clear. It was a scary time and chaplains performed the function of uh, the serv uh, like clergymen in the places of dislocation. So when there are certain rotations for the servicemen, when they are uh, allowed to have their leaves, chaplains participate in the lives of uh, the soldiers. They help them. They want to lift up their spirits and they explain to them that we are fighting for the work of God. We are not just struggling against our enemies, but the enemies of God who went against the truth of God, who went against the children of God, against Christians themselves, like ourselves, like each and every one of us. Therefore, the support that we gain from the state is really appreciable. We feel that it's really tangible. The, there is a special synodal department for chaplains established in the years 2014 and, and 2015, actually. Uh, this was something initiated by Patriarch Philaret. We have the specially appointed and ordained clergymen that take care of our soldiers and servicemen. Uh, they get paid. And prior to that, they had been uh, participating in the armed forces as volunteers who were called the ones who are following the armed forces. And we were very many like that. From my diocese, I am based in the west of Ukraine. We were something like 30 something uh, priests and chaplains. Mm -hmm. So one of our servicemen, uh, one of the priests in our congregation, he gave us the idea that we would have to follow our armed forces as chaplains uh, to support and help and aid our servicemen and soldiers to show that the church abides with the people, with the army, and the soldiers are standing up not just for the independence of Ukraine, but for the truth of God. Father, let me let me ask you a question. Um, you mentioned about <clears throat> the fact that the commandments and the, the issues, I mean, it's incredible to have people have to pick up arms and defend themselves. Uh, Ukraine was living in peace. There was no reason. It was an independent country. It had become an independent country. You were living in peace. And then all of a sudden, boom, this thing happened. Crimea happened. You know, in, in other parts of the world, they think, well, it's just the, the, the Russian invasion in Ukraine. Well, there's also Crimea before that. So we've talked with other people from Ukraine before. This has been going on for a long time. Talk to me, please, and talk to our listeners, both at ATR and OCN here in the States and around the world, about how you dealt with the conflict of you want to go to war, you need to defend oneself because you're innocent. And then you have the commandment saying, thou shalt not kill. You mentioned it briefly, but I don't know if you can go a little deeper. Virtually all chaplain and uh, military people, they have been through Maidan in Kiev. This Maidan, the revolution of dignity, where they had been able to witness death. They had seen the common citizens of Ukraine standing up for their independence, uh, fighting with the, the former president of Ukraine, Yanukovych, and his regime. And they realized what it means to be subservient to Russia. And the majority of the priests from the west of Ukraine, they confronted the war and military action right there in Maidan, down in the heart of Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. And the most rankling painful issue was the people. We had read a lot of books, theological books. And Nicholas of Serbia is the book, is the writer of the one of the book that we, uh, where he developed the issues concerning uh, what priests should be doing with the soldiers during the war, how they should interpret and explain these points to them. So we said to our soldiers that they were not just fighting, they were protecting, they were defending, they were not killing for the sake of killing, but they were killing or wounding for us not to be killed or wounded, not to be hurt. Because the enemy is so 
treacherous, extremely treacherous. And at times, especially at the beginning, it was very difficult to talk people against their convictions. You know, at the beginning, we didn't have even a real army. There were a lot of volunteers, people of no military background, people who were full of patriotism in their heart. They had the faith in God and they had a lot of burning love for their motherland. So the people who were overflowing with their love for their motherland, they knew that they would have to take up arms and go and kill. But their love was greater. This feeling of love exceeded uh, the sensation of hatred for the enemy. So they were not killing out of hatred, but they were protecting and defending us for the sake of love, out of love for their nearest and dearest, their parents and children. So this enabled us to motivate the soldiers, to convince them to go and do their work and restrain the enemy back in those days. This is really the, the issue of love is something that has come out in all of the interviews I've done with folks that are in the Ukraine. Um, let me ask you two final questions, Father. The one is <clears throat> your greatest fear going forward, and the follow-up is your greatest hope as we go forward in this war, which I we all pray throughout the world will end soon. What's your greatest fear now? In 2014 and 15, our greatest fear was just to make sure that you can do something before you die. You wanted to make sure your death was not in vain. You wanted to do a particular mission. A mission had to be accomplished for the sake of which you were ordained as a priest, for the sake of the um, will of God. We were not fearful of ourselves, but we were afraid not to be able to do something very important. And now the fear, as we are moving on, the greatest fear that we have is for our children, for our mates, comrades, friends. My son is an officer. Uh, he's serving in the army. Uh, he serves on the border and he takes part in the defense of our country. My uh, daughter uh, is also willing to become um, a, a border serviceman service woman so she's already there fighting and protecting the borders of ukraine so my greatest fears right now for them it seems to me that the fears that i also sustain are the fear of losing friends recently i had to bury a friend of mine um he was uh, an elder man in my church every week we have to bury uh, dead soldiers and every time when i go to a burial service Sometimes I even imagine to myself that it may be my son's funeral. Oh my. Therefore, it's really difficult. We have hard, hard hearts because young people are dying. And uh, for the most part, they're very young indeed. They're peers of my children. They're friends, friends of my friends. In every parish, there are several soldiers who have already laid their lives and died so the fear is that human pot uh, capital human potential may not be enough may run out we don't have that perfect weapon all of the deficiencies in the arms that we have right now at our disposal we understand fully that we hadn't been preparing for this war because we never hoped to go in and fight However, if we don't have adequate weapons, the more of our young people will be dying. We are conscious that human resources uh, with the Moscovites, with the Russians, they are uncountable. However, human resources in our country are much more limited. Because a lot of people had to flee Ukraine and they went overseas abroad out of fear, maybe not out of fear, but for other reasons. But we have to remind ourselves about Gideon, about whom the Lord said, just select for yourself 300 warriors. You know what I'm talking about. We have these warriors. So we ask from the God 
from the Lord God is to give us wisdom, courage, bravery, and kind heart to our allies so that they can provide us with a bit more weapons because more weapons means fewer losses. More weapons is another step towards our victory, which means that we will be able to preserve the lives of yet another soldier who will be able to start his own family, have kids, and thus will be able to rear another warrior. Because if we don't rear, if we don't bring up soldiers or warriors, this goes for the church and school equally, then our life will go wasted. Because we have a neighbor right next door that forces us to bring up soldiers, not just men, but soldiers, real warriors, yeah. with fighting spirits. So this is the cause, the root of our fear, that we may not have enough time to bring up such soldiers who would be able to stand up in the future and fight for us. Okay. And, and what about greatest hope? What's about you know, hope is a big thing because without hope, we don't have anything. Hope is always with us. We hope and trust in God. This is the first thing. We lay our hope with him. Nobody in the world uh, believed that we could stand out for so long. And the real miracle happened. God produced this miracle because we were virtually armless, defendless. This was a real wonder. Maybe after our victory is gained, we will be analyzing it a lot, some events, how the nation stood up and having no weapons, they managed to um, rebuff the enemy. We rebuffed the enemy for three days, but then three weeks, then a month. And having no trust to hope after all of these events, it, it, it's the same as not to believe in God. If God demonstrated to us, keep fighting. Keep hoping and victory will be yours because God is not in strength. He is in righteousness. God has showed us to, to us so many cases and instances of wonders and miracles that we have no right not to trust, not to believe. Father Vitaly, thank you very much for being with us today. I hope and pray that the day will come when I can visit Ukraine and we can serve together at the altar of God. May God protect you, your family, and all the people of Ukraine. And may he bring end, an end to this unjust war as soon as possible so that all the people of Ukraine and, yes, the people of Russia can live in peace. There's no reason for war in the world. There are too many good things that we can do all together. God bless you, Father. Thank you for your blessing. And I would like to pass on the words to the American nation and thank you for your support of all of the nations in the world that they have been providing to the uh, to Ukraine because our enemy is really powerful and very potent. But for your support and your prayer, but for your good intentions and good deeds, probably we would have already disappeared from this world and this conference call wouldn't be taking place today. So we go, thank God, we thank you. Pray for soldiers, please. We will, Father. Please pray for my children and for other children. Let God bless them. And as you may, please communicate it to your nation and other nations that they shouldn't refuse to help us because we're not just fighting against Russia. We are fighting against global universal evil and this evil has to be punished because evil has no place under the sun. So we kindly ask you to pray for us. We will, Father. We will, Father. Stay strong. God be with you, my friend and brother.